advice. So picture this, right? You've got these Stone Age folks, and we always kind of think of them as, I don't know, stuck on land maybe, like right on the edge of the water, but not really going too far. Right, yeah. But um, what if we've had it wrong this whole time? Like what if they were actually like amazing sailors out on the open ocean? Well, that's kind of the really cool and surprising thing that we're going to be diving into today. Yeah. There's all this new evidence coming out of Malta that is seriously making us rethink how good these early humans were at traveling by sea. That's what I'm talking about. I love it when we get to, you know, kind of blow up the old ideas. Yeah, exactly. So for this deep dive, we've been, you know, digging through a ton of reports from archaeologists and like scientific papers all about these discoveries. Mm -hmm. And our goal today is to really figure out what this all means. Like, how does this evidence show us that Stone Age people were way better at sailing than we ever thought? I mean, the traditional view, right, has always been that, yeah, maybe they crossed some small bits of water here and there. Right. You know, like maybe they got blown off course or something. The total accident, yeah. Like, the idea that they were doing these long trips on purpose, like... Forget it. That was never really considered a possibility. Yeah, like they just didn't have the, I don't know, the smarts, the boats, the um, the navigation skills, or even the guts to do that kind of stuff, right? Exactly. And even the ones we know about, like the first people to make it to Australia, that was always seen as like a one-time thing, mm -hmm. not like proof that they were all sailing around. Yeah. Okay, so what's so different about Malta? Like what's the big deal here? Well, the really fascinating thing about this evidence from Malta is that it suggests something way more deliberate. Okay. Like, they were doing this seafaring thing systematically. Uh -huh. And this was happening back in the Mesolithic period. Okay, now hold on. For those of us who, you know, maybe didn't major in archaeology, right. what exactly does Mesolithic mean? So, basically, it's the Middle Stone Age. Okay. It comes after the last ice age, but before people started farming in a lot of places. Oh, got it. And what's really important here is that this idea of systematic seafaring means it wasn't just random. It was planned and they did it over and over again. So not just some lucky accident. No, not at all. Okay. So the heart of all this is a site called Latinija in northern Malta. Uh -huh. Can you kind of paint us a picture of this place? What's so special about it? So Latinija, it's this really interesting geological formation. It's a sinkhole. Okay. And between 2021 and 2023, archaeologists dug down there mm -hmm. and they found all these layers of sediment. And get this, they were packed with signs of humans being there way further back than we ever thought possible. A sinkhole. That's pretty wild. Yeah. So what did they actually find down there? What kind of stuff are we talking about? Well, they found a bunch of different things, and it all tells us a really interesting story. Okay. They found 64 stone tools. 64? Wow. And here's the thing. Almost all of them were made of limestone. Hmm. And they were mostly just simple flakes made using a really basic technique called hard hammer percussion. And this is different from the tools they found later on in Malta from the Stone Age, which included different types of stone, like chert. <laughs> and they even found some obsidian, which had to have come from somewhere else entirely. So, like, they were bringing in fancier materials later on. Yeah, exactly. I'm interested. But, yeah, back then, simple tools, but they got the job done. Okay, so besides tools, what else did these, uh, you know, these early Maltese residents leave behind? What else can tell us about how they lived? They found a whole bunch of animal bones, which gives us a really good idea of what they were eating. Their grocery list. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. And red deer bones were pretty common, which suggests they were hunting these larger animals on the island. Okay. But there were also lots of bird bones. And get this, a huge number of shells, like around 10,000, from these sea snails. Wow, 10,000 shells. That's a lot of escargot. Right. I mean, I guess that's not what they were going for. Well, who knows? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. You never know. But yeah, these snails, they're called Forcus turbinatus and limpets. Okay. That's a mouthful. It is. But they're like shellfish, right? Yeah, exactly. Types of shellfish. Yeah. And on top of all that, they also found smaller amounts of other stuff. Okay. Like reptiles, turtles, tortoises, fish-like groupers, crustaceans like crabs, spiny creatures like sea urchins. Wow. So they were really taking advantage of everything the island had to offer. Yeah, they were getting it all. Surf and turf, Stone Age style. Exactly. Oh. And then even some bones from marine mammals, 
marine mammals? Like what? But specifically seals. Seals in Malta. Yeah. It's pretty cool, right? That is cool. It really shows how diverse their diet was. Yeah. They're getting food from both the land and the sea. They were super adaptable. It wasn't just like a random pile of bones, though, right? Like, there's got to be signs that these animals were, you know, actually being used by humans. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. A lot of the animal bones had these clear-cut marks, which means they were butchered by humans to get the meat. And here's another really important thing. About 25% of the animal remains that they studied, like the red deer, birds, tortoises, and even those sea snails, they all showed signs of burning or charring. So they were cooking them up? Exactly. Looks like they were having some Stone Age barbecues. I love it. And then, to top it off, some bones had these notches that looked like they were made on purpose by hitting them. Mm -hmm. And they were broken in a specific way called green fracturing. Okay, I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, so these are other signs that humans were using these bones probably to get to the marrow inside. So they were really resourceful. Oh, yeah. For sure. Getting every last bit of nutrition. So this really paints a picture of people, you know, actually living and thriving in Malta using everything around them. Yeah, it's amazing. But I mean, the thing that really blows my mind and like changes everything we thought we knew about their sailing skills is how old the site is, right? Yeah, that's the kicker. So what does the dating tell us? They did radiocarbon dating on 32 pieces of charcoal and one of the animal bones. Uh -huh. And the results were amazing. They found out that Litnija was first occupied around 8,500 years ago. Wow, 8,500 years? And here's the crucial thing. That's about 1,000 years before the Neolithic farmers showed up in Malta. Whoa, so these seafarers, were there like a whole millennium before anyone else we knew about? Yeah, it totally changes our timeline of Maltese prehistory. A 1,000 years earlier, that's huge. It is, it's a massive difference. And getting to Malta back then, that wasn't exactly a walk in the park, was it? Like, how far are we talking about? No, here? it was definitely a journey. Yeah. Malta is at least 100 kilometers of open ocean away from the nearest land, which is Sicily. That's a long way, especially, you know, for people in the Mesolithic period. It is. And the researchers think that to take advantage of the currents, the most likely place they left from in Sicily would have been even further east. Okay. Around the Gulf of Gila, which means the trip would have been right around that 100 kilometer mark. So they weren't just like swept there by accident. No way. This was intentional. They knew what they were doing. Definitely. This means they could navigate and cross open water. Yeah, they had some serious skills. Okay, but here's the thing. We haven't actually found any boats from this time period in Malta, right? There's true. We haven't found any direct evidence of their boats yet. So how do we even know what they were using? Well, we can look at similar discoveries from around the same time for clues. Uh -huh. Eleanor Sari and her team point to the 7,000-year-old dugout canoes that were found in northern Italy. Okay, dugout canoes, that's interesting. Yeah. But those are from Italy, and they're, you know, still pretty old, but not as old as the Malta site. Right. So how did those help us understand what people might have been using to reach Malta 1,500 years earlier? Well, these Italian canoes, they were made by hollowing out single tree trunks. Okay. And they show us the kind of boat building technology that existed back then. Mm -hmm. The biggest one they found was a whopping 11 meters long, and it had features that suggest it was made for the open ocean. So it's seaworthy. Yeah. And get this. Mm -hmm. They had these weird holes that some people think might have been for attaching outriggers. Outriggers? What are those? They're basically floats that you add to the sides of a canoe to make it more stable. Okay. Which would have been super important for those long and potentially rough sea voyages. Makes sense. So the point is that these discoveries show us that people had the technology to build surprisingly sophisticated boats way earlier than we thought. Okay. So it's totally possible that they used something similar to reach Malta. That's fascinating. Yeah. So it wasn't just like rafts or something. No, they were probably using something a lot more advanced than that. Okay, so let's say they did use something like a dugout canoe. Uh-huh. What would that journey to Malta have actually been like? Well, they've done experiments with replicas of these kinds of canoes. Okay. And they figured they could travel at about four kilometers per hour. Four kilometers per hour. Hmm. Yeah, so to cover 100 kilometers, that would take about 25 hours. Wow, 25 hours. 
hours. Which means that they probably had to navigate at least part of the time at night. Night navigation in the Stone Age. Yeah, I know. It's crazy, right? That's incredible. Like, how did they even do that? It would have been a huge challenge. Yeah. They probably would have needed a good understanding of the stars for navigation. So, like, celestial navigation. Exactly. Wow. And they also would have needed to know about ocean currents. To help them stay on course? Yeah. It really shows you how aware they were of their environment and how skilled they were at navigation. Skills that we just didn't think they had back then. I know. It's really amazing. This Malta discovery, it's not just a one-off thing, right? Like, there's other evidence popping up all over the place that supports this idea of early seafaring in the Mediterranean. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Tell me more. So there was this genetic study done in Tunisia recently. Uh -huh. And they analyzed the DNA of an 8,000-year-old individual. 8,000 years old. That's mind-blowing. Right that we can even do that. No, the technology is incredible. Yeah. Anyway, they found these genetic markers that indicate European hunter-gatherer ancestry. Wow, really? Yeah, which suggests that there was probably some migration happening south across the Mediterranean. And Malta could have been, like, a stop along the way. Exactly, one possible route. So Malta wasn't just this, like, random island out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yep. It could have been part of a bigger network of sea travel. That's the idea. I like that. And other archaeologists are on board with this, too. Yeah. Like Cyprian Broodbank, he thinks that these findings bring us closer to confirming that people and technologies were being exchanged across the Mediterranean way earlier than we thought. That's really cool. Yeah. So we've got these hunter-gatherers arriving in Malta 8,500 years ago. Uh -huh. But then later on... Around 7,400 years ago, we've got the Stone Age farmers coming in. Right. And they're bringing a whole different way of life with them, right? Like, they're starting to farm and domesticate animals. It's like a whole new chapter in Maltese prehistory. Totally. And there's this archaeologist, Rowan McLaughlin. Yeah. He has this theory that the expansion of farming communities from places like the Fertile Crescent and Anatolia into Europe, hmm. that this happened around 9,000 years ago. Okay. And that might have caused some problems or disruptions that forced some hunter-gatherer groups to, like, look for new territories. Wow. And maybe that's why some of them ended up in Malta. Yeah, it's a really interesting idea. So we've got these hunter-gatherers living in Malta, but what was it actually like for them? Like, what was daily life like on the island? Well, we know they used resources from both the land and the sea. Uh -huh. But we can actually get a pretty good picture of their life from the archaeological evidence. Oh, okay, tell me more. So they found a ton of red deer bones, which tells us they were pretty successful at hunting on land. Oh, okay. But the crazy number of marine gastropod shells, like... Remember those 10,000 shells? Yeah, hard to yeah. forget. Right. That, along with the remains of fish and even those marine mammals, mm -hmm. it really shows you how much they depended on the sea. Yeah, makes sense, living on an island and all. And here's the thing. Mm. That's actually pretty different from what people were eating later on in the Neolithic period in Malta. Really? Yeah, their diet seemed to be more focused on stuff from the land, like plants they grew and livestock. So the first long-term residents of Malta had a totally different relationship with the environment than the people who came later. Exactly. That's pretty wild. It is. What about the environment itself? Like, can we figure out what Malta actually looked like back then, 8,500 years ago? Yeah, we can actually piece together a pretty good picture from something called archaeobotanical analysis. Archaeobotanical analysis. That sounds complicated. It's basically studying stuff like pollen, plant remains, and charcoal. Okay. So from that, we know that there were a lot of grasses around. Okay. Mostly what are called C3 types, but with some C4 varieties too. C3, C4, I'm lost. Don't worry about the details. Basically, they're just different types of grasses. Okay. But the pollen records show that there was also a lot of open shrub vegetation, oh. including plants like Erica multiflora and Euphorbia melitensis. And those are feasts. They're types of shrubs. Gotcha. And then in the wetter areas, there were patches of Pistachio lentiscus. Pistachio lentiscus. Is that like a pistachio tree? It's related. It's a type of mastic tree. Okay. They also looked at the charcoal that these people burned, mm -hmm. and it showed that the landscape was pretty shrubby, kind of like it is today. Okay. Dominated by, you guessed it, more a pistachia, but pistachio C.F. lentiscus, juniper, and tetraclinus. Tetraclinus, another new one for me. It's a type of cypress tree. Okay. And they probably also used the Mediterranean fan palm as fuel. Oh, like the ones you see all over the Mediterranean. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, and we know they used them because they found these microscopic silica bodies right. from those plants in the hearths where they had fires. Microscopic silica bodies? What are those called? 
They're called phytoliths. Phytoliths. Okay, so basically like plant fossils. Kind of, yeah. They're these tiny little pieces of evidence that tell us what plants were around. That's really neat. It is. It's like a little window into the past. So when the Neolithic settlers arrived a few centuries later, uh -huh. they weren't exactly stepping into this, like, untouched paradise. Nope. Humans had already been there for a while, shaping the landscape. That's a really important point. It is. So if we zoom out and look at the bigger picture, mm -hmm. it seems like the stuff we're learning about Malta, it fits into this growing body of evidence that points to early maritime activity all over the Mediterranean. Oh, absolutely. It's like a whole new understanding of what was going on back then. Totally. So what else are we seeing? Like what other connections are there? Well, we're finding all these technological similarities between Mesolithic and Epipaleolithic communities. Okay, remind me, Epipaleolithic, that's like the late Stone Age, right? Yeah, exactly. And these communities were on both sides of the Mediterranean, in Africa and Europe. So even though they were separated by this huge body of water, they were still connected in some ways. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And some researchers even think that the South Central Mediterranean and the Eastern Maghreb, uh -huh. that that area might have been like a hub for early seafaring. Interesting why there. Well, the distances between islands there are relatively short. Okay. And the coastlines are really indented, so there are lots of natural harbors and sheltered spots. Makes sense. So it would have been a pretty good place to start experimenting with sea travel. So Malta is like another piece of this puzzle, right? Yeah, exactly. And it pushes back the timeline for when we know people were making these difficult open water crossings. It really does. I mean, think about it. They were doing this thousands of years before they had more advanced sailing technologies. Yeah, it's pretty mind-blowing. It really shows you how resourceful and capable they were. Totally. Okay, let's wrap things up for our listeners. What's the big takeaway from all this? Like, what should people remember about these Malta discoveries? Well, the main thing is this. These 8,500-year-old settlements in Malta, they give us really strong evidence that people were sailing in the Mediterranean during the Stone Age. And not just, like, messing around in little boats, but actually crossing open ocean. Exactly. Wow. And this completely changes how we think about how mobile hunter-gatherers were. Uh-huh. It tells us that the prehistoric world was way more interconnected than we thought. It really makes you wonder, what other assumptions about early humans do we need to rethink now? Like, what other places might they have reached that we thought were impossible? I don't know, but it's exciting to think about. It is. There's still so much we don't know. Yeah, who knows what other discoveries are waiting out there. That's what I love about archaeology. There's always something new to learn. Exactly. The past is full of surprises. It really is. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Okay. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive into the world of Stone Age seafarers. It was my pleasure. Until next time, keep exploring. And keep questioning everything. You got it. Bye.